Avatar The Last Airbender is one of the most universally loved pieces of media on the planet. It's one of only a handful of TV shows with a perfect score of 100% on Rotten Tomatoes, and is cited as an inspiration for dozens of other works. It's about as well received as an animated TV show can reasonably get, so it makes sense that the writers of Nickelodeon would want to make more. And so, four years after The Last Airbender ended, we got The Legend of Korra. The Legend of Korra was originally planned to be a one-season miniseries before getting expanded into a four-season-long full sequel show to The Last Airbender. And while general opinion is still positive, people pretty much universally agree it's worse, and a lot of folks outright dislike it. And I have to admit, I'm kind of one of those people. Don't get me wrong, the show has some really great parts, which I'll talk about throughout the video, but it also has some not-so-great bits, and today I'm going to be talking super in-depth about one particular stinker. The villain of the first season, Amon. Okay, now for a quick exposition dub for those of you who don't already know stuff about the series. If you do, feel free to skip to this point in the video. I'm sorry for doing this, but this video is going to be very confusing if you don't get this stuff. The Legend of Korra is set in the world of Avatar. It's based loosely on East Asia, with four nations each being inspired by a different area of the world. Some of the people from each of these nations have an ability called bending. Basically, depending on which nation they came from, they can control one of the four elements. Earth, fire, water, and air. They used to live in harmony until the rapidly industrializing and increasingly nationalistic Fire Nation attacked, starting a 100-year-long war that the main characters ended in the first show. The Avatar is the only person who can bend all four elements and can go into a trance called the Avatar State, where they become incredibly powerful. When one Avatar dies, they're reincarnated into a new body. Aang is the current Avatar and also the last airbender, cute title screen, since the Fire Nation committed a genocide that wiped out all of the air nomads except for him. Flash forward about 50 years, Aang is dead, and he gets reincarnated as Korra, a girl from the Southern Water Tribe. The former colonies the Fire Nation had in the Earth Kingdom have transformed into a new nation called the United Republic, with its capital, Republic City, being the main setting of the first season. Okay, sorry about that, but this video would be incredibly confusing without those three and a half seasons of context. Now, who is this Amon guy, and why do I have such a problem with him? Amon is the villain of the first season of The Legend of Korra, who want to get rid of bending by taking the ability away from all the people who can use it. They claim that benders have been horribly oppressing non-benders for ages, that the only way to fix this is by using Amon's special abilities to end bending altogether. Alright, interesting premise. It's the classic villain who kind of has a point trope, where you have a character with a debatably morally good motivation who goes way too far to try to achieve it. The only problem is, Amon doesn't have a point, it's obvious that he doesn't have a point, the show never addresses the fact that he doesn't have a point, and even if he did have a point, that would make the story make even less sense. Let's get into it. I want to start out with some positives. Amon is aesthetically awesome. He's got this cool mask, he's wearing a big black hood, his theme is really creepy, and his voice is intimidating. His bloodbending is freaky, like he's force choking people, and his ability to take away someone's bending forever adds a lot of genuine stakes to some scenes. The same thing goes for the Equalists, their uniforms are really cool, with the green goggles and gas mask looking things, and having them all be trained chi blockers was really cool until they dropped it for something far less interesting. In fact, this applies to the entire first season. Everything they include looks awesome, sounds awesome, is very well animated, and has a great score. They got really creative with the overall world design. I really love the steampunk aesthetic. I know people complain about it a lot, but I feel like it's a natural progression considering the world was going through a bit of an industrial revolution back in the first series. The technology from the tanks has turned into cars, the war balloons have become civilian blimps, and electricity is now widely available. My only real problem with the show is the writing. The writers introduce this plot 12 minutes into episode 1, when we meet this guy in a park. He's standing on top of a small booth surrounded by a handful of people, proselytizing about the problems with society. He talks about how non-benders are being oppressed by benders, and how the leader of the Equalists, a man named Amon, can stop them. He's notably the only member of the Equalists who doesn't wear a mask, and mentions that benders are treating them like second-class citizens, both things that will be important later. He's incredibly annoying and smug, he strawmans Korra as a violent psychopath, and then everyone in the crowd instantly flips to his side. This is not in the slightest how activism works, but whatever. It's a little weird to see such a blatant stereotype of an activist before we see any of the problems he's talking about, but that's fine as long as we can see it later on. If we see an example of benders oppressing non-benders soon, then all of this will be recontextualized, and it'll make sense why he was out here protesting and why the crowd is so quick to flip on Korra, for the most part. We don't see that. The next scene in the show is a gang called the Triple Threats extorting a guy for money. A lot of people use this to defend the plot of season 1, saying this is an example of oppression in the first episode. There are two problems with this idea. Number one is that we don't know if the shopkeeper is a bender or not. If he's a non-bender, then maybe it's a targeted thing, and this gang is going after non-benders throughout the city since they're easier to rob. 
but if he's a bender, it's not targeted, it's just extortion, something that, while it still sucks, is no reason to start a goddamn revolution over. And even if it was targeted, that's not the type of oppression that really fucks people over. The most important elements are usually interpersonal hatred, institutional discrimination, and class. Interpersonal hatred would be things like people calling each other slurs, being dismissive because of race, gender, or any other trait you can't change, or targeting people for murder because they're part of a minority group. Institutional discrimination would be things like the Jim Crow laws in the 60s USA, apartheid South Africa, or when Iran kills people for being gay, where the actual government starts being iron-fisted against specific groups of people it's bigoted against. Class discrimination tends to result from the other two. It's basically trying to make the targeted group as poor and therefore as weak as possible by not investing in their neighborhoods and paying them less than your other employees. This keeps the minority poor and reliant on the rich and powerful majority. Now, which of these is present in the legend of Korra? None of them. We never see or hear anything about how non-benders are significantly poorer than benders. In fact, both of the richest people in the show can't bend. There's nothing about how jobs that require bending pay more. They don't ever state or even imply that. We don't see any interpersonal discrimination. Literally no one ever treats anyone else poorly for being a non-bender, but plenty of non-benders treat benders like shit. And the only institutional discrimination comes eight episodes into a 12 episode season after the equalists have been consistently committing massive acts of terrorism for seemingly no reason. And this begs the question, how do the equalists have so much support? This isn't some tiny group of powerful radicals, it's a massive organization that, by episode 3, has huge crowds of support. We're supposed to believe that an enormous number of the people in the city are super fed up with bending, but we're never given a reason why. This would be like if out of nowhere everyone with brown eyes suddenly rose up and started fucking bombing buildings and essentially disabling people left and right. There's absolutely nothing that would trigger that, so it wouldn't make sense. There are sometimes violent protests and full-out riots in real life, but they're always based off of something that's actually a controversial issue in society, like racism or who won the 2020 US election. The difference is, the protests always come after a huge controversy. They all have some sort of reasoning behind them, whether it's correct or moronically stupid. In Korra, the issue they're talking about literally just doesn't exist, and it doesn't affect people's daily lives in the slightest. Nobody in the show thinks discrimination is a problem until they hear a 30 second speech from Amman. Amman is supposed to be based off of Mao Zedong, a Marxist-Leninist revolutionary who wanted to overthrow the Republic of China. And the thing about Mao is, although he was a horrible person, he did talk about a lot of legitimate grievances that were plaguing the Chinese people. Japan had just invaded China and essentially colonized Manchuria, and the government was doing very little about it. Inequality was rampant, tons of people were dying, the government was questionably democratic, and things were generally really bad for the nation in the 1930s. It makes sense that a guy promising to bring equality and freedom would become popular in a country that had historically struggled with it. Unfortunately, he didn't deliver on his promise, and millions of people died. My point is, Amon doesn't bring up any legitimate grievances, so it doesn't make any sense why he would get so popular. Yes, vendors are powerful, and that sucks, but it doesn't look like it's leading to any income inequality. Non-benders aren't being targeted because they're easier to deal with. Like, it's really hard to overstate how in this 12 episode season, there is absolutely nothing to justify people supporting Amon. It's implied that all the members of the city council are benders, but one, we know this isn't always true. Like, it isn't a requirement. Sokka and a non-bending air acolyte were on the council back in Yukon's time. Even if it was a requirement, we don't see them making any discriminatory laws until again, episode 8, when they start a curfew for all non-benders. Plus, they never confirm in the show itself that these people are benders, so there's literally no way to know this except through outside sources. And I think that's the biggest shame with the season. They could have had a really interesting conversation about the oppression of non-benders. The world of Avatar is unequal, at least in theory. Benders are extremely powerful and potentially incredibly dangerous. They would have opportunities that non-benders wouldn't, like if you want to work in construction, you probably have to be an earthbender. The writers could have constructed a world in which being a bender meant you were massively privileged in society, where non-bending families are despotically poor and families where everyone can bend are unbelievably rich. It would be somebody being born into power because of their genetics. Benders might start having feelings of superiority. Hell, Zuko having weak firebending was a big reason why Fire Lord Ozai didn't like him. In The Last Airbender, Toph is super dismissive of Sokka because he can't bend, and Sokka himself actually feels inferior. The whole airbender genocide happened because Sozin didn't just think that the Fire Nation was superior, he thought that firebending was too. 
discrimination against non-benders somehow managed to be more relevant to the plot of The Last Airbender than it did to the season of The Legend of Korra that was trying to be about it. I would have forgiven a significant portion of the season if there was just a single line in one of the first two or three episodes about discrimination. Like, you know that guy halfway through episode one who jumps out of a bush and asks Korra for a fish because he can't afford food? I would have loved it if, after Korra asked him why he couldn't afford it by his own, he said something like, well, I would love to, but nobody in my family is a bender, and if you want one of those fancy jobs at the power plant, well, you've got to be able to shoot lightning. Even if I got a job, I wouldn't be able to pay my rent. Like, there you go. There's some discrimination. Non-benders are paid a lot less, and so the ones that can't get financial assistance from the bending members of their family are just screwed. That's a legitimate reason for people to be upset. It would come before any mention of the Equalists, and it would instantly make the season about 20% better. But there's nothing like that in any of the 12 episodes of the show. And here's problem number two. Let's assume, despite all evidence, that discrimination against non-benders is a problem, or at the very least, people think it's a problem. Why isn't there any sort of peaceful movement in the show to address the issue that 75% of the population has to deal with on a daily basis? If Amon is supposed to be a Malcolm X figure, where is Martin Luther King Jr.? Where's the one advocating for peaceful protests, strikes, and boycotts? Where are the activists making matches for people who can't firebend or helping non-earthbenders with their construction projects? What about a law saying that non-benders have to get paid an equal amount to their bending co-workers, like the discrimination bills in America? Why is nobody advocating for something like that? Why is there literally no one addressing this major societal problem except for the absolute worst genocidal maniac? The only person trying to stop this injustice also ordered a bombing campaign on his own city? There's not one peaceful protest during the entire run of the first season, and yet you're expecting me to believe that Amon somehow managed to get tens of thousands of supporters in his stadium by episode 12? Even if we're going with a revolutionary angle, there were significant social democratic, democratic socialist, and anarchist Marxist movements during the time of Lenin and Mao, trying to improve society in the same ways they thought were required, just with way less bloodshed. Where are the democratic socialist activists Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, and Helen Keller? Why aren't there any peaceful movements or strikes in season one? Even with the subjects I really disagree with, there are still people advocating for non-violent solutions along with the stochastic terrorists. In fact, they're almost always the majority. It really takes validity away from the question of non-vendor oppression, considering its only advocates are people who run around the city in gas masks, electrocuting and then kidnapping innocent people, and then disabling them for the rest of their lives. The only person in the entire show who advocates for Amon peacefully is this smug asshole from episode 1. Other than him, every equalist in the entire season is just beating the shit out of random people on the street, then taking away the thing that they might be relying on for their livelihoods. The show isn't actually trying to make you consider if Amon is a point, because if it were, it'd be spending a lot less time on them kidnapping and crippling people, and any time at all on actually spreading their reasoning for their beliefs. The show would be bringing up the obvious ways to actually solve or deal with a problem that don't involve violating people. It's like everyone in Republic City had a switch flipped in their brain to only let them choose the most violent possible solution to a given problem. And a solution that would have been disastrous, considering... Amon's argument for taking people's bending away was that it was a source of conflict. After all, he argues, a firebender killed his family and burned his face. Now, we later learn that he's lying about this, but this story could have absolutely been true, and that's a stated motivation for his actions that manages to convince, at the very least, tens of thousands of people to his side. Interestingly, it actually kind of mirrors discussions about gun control in the USA. There's only one difference. You can't use a gun to build a house. Bending isn't just a tool that's used for violence, it's an aspect that makes all of life easier for the people in Avatar. Sure, a forklift might be able to lift some big stone blocks, but an earthbender is going to be a lot quicker and a lot more precise. A refrigerator can keep stuff cold, but it's a lot more expensive and takes up a lot more power than somebody who can just turn water into ice. And having people who can light fires and shoot lightning would be invaluable for early 20th century technology. Amon's whole argument is that bending is the biggest cause for violence in Avatar, and you know what? He's not wrong. It's magic. It's the biggest cause for everything, good and bad. 
Without waterbenders, the entire healthcare system in the United Republic would completely collapse. Maybe the waterbenders are being extortionate, causing more and more money to collect in their pockets as people are forced to pay higher and higher medical bills. That sounds like it'd be a really cool justification for some talk about regulation. Hey, I'm a fan of free healthcare. I'd be down. But we don't get stuff like that because the season is more concerned about showing how evil Amon is than giving him actual arguments that could realistically convince people. And my problem is that literally nobody ever confronts him on his terrible ideas. The only argument the heroes ever give is, well, you can't take bending away because bending is cool, which doesn't actually address any of the points Amon makes. Nobody ever says, hey, Amon, you do realize that if you remove bending, it'll make construction like 10 times harder, right? Like, without the ability to move giant bricks with your mind, we'd have to use much slower, more expensive, or more physically taxing methods, and the cost of housing would skyrocket. It would cause citywide poverty on a scale incomparable to anything we've seen before. The only way Amon has a point is if literally nobody ever challenges him on his beliefs, which is what happens. Calling bending evil is like calling knives or hammers illegal. Sure, you can use them to kill people, and that's pretty awful, but the vast majority of the time, we're just using them to make our lives easier. It'd be pretty hard to cut a steak with a spoon or build a table without a way to nail things together, and bending works the same way. Removing bending because some people have committed atrocities with it would be like making electricity illegal because sometimes people get electrocuted or it causes electrical fires. Like, yeah, that happens sometimes and it really sucks, but it's also power for our heating, cooling, lighting, healthcare, communication, and arts. There are better ways of dealing with the dangers, like power breakers and rubber. Amon is pulling the avatar equivalent of banning electricity. And this all collapses in the dumbest way possible, when everyone realizes Amon is in fact a waterbender and a bloodbender. The show treats this like this is some incredible revelation that causes the entire equalist movement to crumble. Like, obviously, it would make sense why nobody would want to follow Amon after that. It'd be like discovering Malcolm X was secretly a cop the whole time. Even if people still agreed with what he said, they'd perceive him as being a lot less credible, since not only would he have lied for years, but he also would have been advocating against groups he's a part of. But the will for change would still be there, and so there would still be people advocating for equality between races. The problem here is that people realize Amon is a waterbender, and then the show treats that like it's the end of the conversation. Like, that's the end of the season, all of the kidnapping and riots stop, they basically never bring him up again throughout the rest of the show, and that's just the end of it. After Amon's death by Tarlock's honestly pretty awesome heroic sacrifice, the Equalists just disappear as a faction. I would expect this from a religious organization or a cult, but not a protest group that thinks there's a legitimate problem with society. Amon being a waterbender doesn't change the fact that non-benders are second-class citizens, assuming that's actually true, something that, again, the show never makes clear. They were too busy having really well-animated action scenes that were still ultimately pointless. Every time Equalists come in, there are a bunch of dramatic shots and huge set pieces. They're basically distracting you from the poor writing by pointing at explosions and cool music. And that stuff's really good, sure, but it can't make up for a villain that makes no sense. One of the things that made the last Airbender special was its messages. It had a bunch of great little ones that it delivered individually, but the vast majority ended up leading back to the central theme, the horrors of war. Almost every episode is focused on some sort of negative effect of the Hundred Years' War, whether it's the victims, the destruction, the propaganda, the personal loss, the environmental destruction, or the hatred. Almost every episode is focused on some sort of negative aspect of war. It ends up being one of the deepest discussions of a subject in any children's media, due to the sheer lengths it goes to to convey the seemingly simple theme that war is bad. There are a few exceptions, like The King of Omashu and The Cave of Two Lovers, but those are usually entirely character-focused episodes, which are fine to drive forward our main characters' arcs. They used all 61 of their episodes economically, with very little pointless material. Even the stuff that was ultimately pointless was usually at least funny or entertaining. The Legend of Korra takes a different approach. They only have 12 episodes in the first season, and yet they decided to cover the significantly more complicated subject of societal discrimination. And then they spend a huge portion of that time on completely pointless stuff. Right after the super plot important episode 4, they have an entire one and a half episodes dedicated to a pro-bending tournament arc with a villain so boring that I've literally never heard any mention of him in any of the half dozen reviews I've seen of the series. His name's Tano, by the way. He's really dull. All of this time we could have been spending developing the wildly underdeveloped main plot is instead spent on a competition that absolutely nobody cares about. Its only relevance to the main story is that Amon crashes through the wall in the last third of the episode to talk about how having a sport based around bending somehow equates to worshipping it. 
And that's not even talking about the romantic subplot. Some of it was decently well integrated, but a lot of it is here for cheap drama that does nothing but waste time. The love triangle is probably the most universally disliked aspect of season 1 since it's not well written, takes up valuable time, crops up in the most annoying places, and amounts to absolutely nothing. Okay, so Korra thinks Mako is hot, but then Sami crashes into Mako and now Mako thinks she's hot. Pro tip girls, if you think a guy is cute, hit him with your motorcycle. So they go on a date, but Bolin likes Korra, so Korra goes on a date with Bolin to make Mako jealous and it works, so then Mako comes outside and Korra kisses him and Mako kisses back and Bolin sees it, which causes him to get really mopey due to being cheated on, but he doesn't tell anyone and then Korra and Mako keep it a secret until Bolin lets it slip to Asami who's been going out with Mako and has been getting really jealous of all the attention he's paying to Korra, so she keeps getting angry at Mako until the end of the season when Mako cheats on Asami with Korra again. That is the most convoluted and complicated love triangle I've seen in such a short period of time, and yet somehow all of the relationships still end up feeling shallow by the end of it. And as much as I thought Korra's struggles about learning airbending were really well written, they just drop them about three episodes into the series until it finally comes back in the very last episode out of nowhere. Like, no build-up, they never show Korra practicing, it's just something that happens when the main villain threatens her bland love interest. The writers even added a line from Tencent to the first few episodes about how airbending will eventually just click, as if they're making excuses for not building it up in the slightest for nine straight episodes of the show. And it's all time that could have been spent fleshing out Amon's motivations. Genuinely, what is Amon's motivation? Because the whole story about him wanting revenge because a firebender killed his family is a lie. Tarlek tells us that his brother always wanted things to be fair, and that's why he wanted to remove everyone's bending. His story implies that Amon did it because he has daddy issues and wanted to get revenge on his father, Yakon, for putting him through harsh training. But then the story also implies that it's just a power grab, that Amon doesn't actually believe any of it, and he just wanted to be king of the world. So which one is it? Is it two of them? Is it all three? Is it none of them? We don't know. The show doesn't spend any time making it clear why the main villain is doing what he's doing. And while that might work with some other characters who are a bit less grounded, Amon is supposed to be reflective of real-world politics. We need to know, and we don't, because we spend our time in a sports arena instead. The problem with Amon is that he's part of a group of villains that I call the has a point so millions must die crowd. I call them that because I don't have a better name for it. Basically, these are villains who actually do kind of have a point, or the story frames them in a way that makes you think they do, but then they take the absolute most illogical conclusion from that good point, usually that they have to kill everyone. And this is supposed to make the audience think that because the villain is evil and murderous, that we can forget about addressing the thing that was supposedly motivating them. One example of this is Thanos. His whole thing is that he thinks the universe is suffering from massive overpopulation, causing mass hunger and wars over resources. He vows to stop this by collecting all of the Infinity Stones, giving him incredible power and finally allowing him to increase the amount of resources in the universe, make sure they're distributed more fairly where they actually need to go, make everyone's bodies 100% nutrient efficient so not only do we need way less food, but we also never need to poop. Nope, he wants to commit the biggest mass genocide of all time. He took the absolute worst possible conclusion from his valid point, and we're supposed to just deal with that? And it'd be one thing if Infinity War were about trying to stop overpopulation, you know, addressing the supposed problem as best they can, but no, it's about stopping Thanos, and his motivations are completely irrelevant. The writers of Infinity War gave a character infinite power to stop a legitimate problem that he supposedly cared about, and then decided to make him do the absolute stupidest thing with that power. And then, by the time Endgame is over, and everyone's gotten their happy endings, overpopulation is still a problem. Like, they never fix it, or address it, or anything. And it kind of taints the post-Endgame stuff for me, because every time I'm watching a Marvel property now, I think about how they never actually stop the supposedly enormous problem Thanos brought up. You're just supposed to assume that because Thanos was evil and genocidal for no reason, that his legitimate grievances don't matter and you can forget about them. This was actually my biggest problem with the first Incredibles movie. I really like the film, but Syndrome rubs me the wrong way. He brings up this really interesting idea about how he can give everyone superpowers with his technology. Like, dude, that's incredible! You're a genius inventor, you can give everyone the ability to fly with your rocket boots. People could use your telekinetic beam to lift heavy objects, or your giant robots to explore space in the oceans. Yeah, it can be dangerous, like we don't want Syndrome to just give everyone laser eyes, that'd be disastrous. But with some nuance and creativity, this could be an awesome plotline. So what do they do with it? They have him say one line in a creepy voice, and then they never bring it up again. What? Yeah, they just drop it. They also give Syndrome an unrelated hatred for all superheroes, so you know that you should root against him. His supposed motivation of making everyone super has 
absolutely no impact on the plot, which is just him trying to kill superheroes with a giant robot. And don't get me wrong, I like The Incredibles and Infinity War, especially The Incredibles, but I was really disappointed that the villains had these really interesting motivations and then the plot seemingly dropped them. Amon is another one of these. Ultimately, all of his talk about wanting equality is pointless because the writers never elaborate on it. It doesn't go anywhere. After Amon leaves, they never bring up non-bender discrimination again. Amon isn't just a terribly thought out straw man, he just doesn't make any sense in the greater world of Avatar. He also invalidates what could have been a really interesting conversation. All the equality stuff is just spice that they throw in, spice that inadvertently causes massive plot holes across the entire rest of the series. I can't imagine a world in which this plot is much worse, so how about we imagine one where it's better? The thing that really gets to me is that Amon and the Equalists could have hypothetically been really interesting and nuanced. I've thought of a handful of ways you could do that. Number one, playing it straight. Discrimination against non-benders is a legitimate problem in society, and the show shows that. Non-benders usually live in poverty, benders are usually super rich, and all of the people in positions of power are benders. Pull a Rhodesia or an apartheid South Africa where a tiny minority of people holds all the power in society. Families with lots of benders aren't necessarily evil, but most do work to uphold the system since it benefits them. Here we can use one of the most interesting and wasted characters in the series, Hiroshi Sato. Instead of him being a nonsensically motivated monster who tries to kill his own daughter, have him be a bender. In this version, Hiroshi Sato is an engineer who managed to rise to the top partially because he could bend. He left other, potentially even more genius engineers in the dust, because it turns out being able to manipulate fire and electricity is super useful when you're trying to work with industrial machinery. He believes that he got as rich as he did because of his hard work and brains, and that Republic City is a meritocracy, when in reality he only got to where he is because he was privileged at birth. Now, there are two ways you could go next. The first one is to have Amon still be evil and control a small group of radicals. They aren't as ridiculously violent as they are in the real show, they aren't bombing the city or anything, but they are destroying stuff and kidnapping a few particularly bad government officials to remove their bending. But there's also a second character. This one is significantly more popular among the actual citizens of the city. They're passionate, caring, they set up mutual aid, and they organize peaceful protests and strikes, but the government still treats them as if they're evil. The police make up fake criminal charges and throw this activist in prison, and this causes Amon to gain popularity. Stuff's getting bad, he's clashing with the police and both sides are destroying stuff, and Korra and the gang have to break the peaceful one out of prison to calm things down. Eventually they take down Amon, and the peaceful activist becomes the mayor of Republic City off of an enormous wave of support from the non-bending population. They get rid of all the horrible discriminatory laws, put in place some anti-discrimination protections so that the benders have to be paid fairly, make attacking a non-bender with bending a hate crime, all that. Make him a real Nelson Mandela figure. And then that character could remain kind of important throughout the rest of the story. That way, you could solve a plot about a guy who has a point but goes too far, while adding in some nuance and making it feel realistic. The other way you could go about this is to have Amon actually be correct, but the gang disagrees with him. Have Korra actually feel superior because she can bend, make the societal problems legitimate, and have Amon not be a genocidal nutjob. He's a bit extreme, taking away the bending of high-ranking politicians and police officers, but he's actually right, and although his methods might be a bit much, the situation non-benders are stuck in is actually really terrible. Korra ends up coming around to his way of thinking, she acts like a mediator between the government and Amon, and they get some stuff done to make Republic City more equal. In this scenario, Amon is more of a Malcolm X figure, a guy who, despite being a bit violent and some of his conclusions being a bit extreme, was completely correct about how bad racism was in the 50s and 60s. Okay, now that that possibility is over, here's another idea. Make Amon a cult leader. There was this really crazy event that happened in China, where a southern Chinese guy named Hong Xiu Chun, claiming that he was the brother of Jesus and chosen by God, tried to take over China and convert everyone to his religion. Amon actually has quite a few parallels to this guy. He claims that he was chosen by the spirits, he tried to take over the United Republic, and he tries to convert tons of people by taking away their bending. He could make for a really creepy and intimidating villain if they leaned harder into this and ditched the civil rights motivation. He could start out the season by claiming that he was chosen by the spirits to take away bending, but no one takes him seriously. Then he shows everyone his power in episode 3, and word starts to spread about this guy with powers equaling the Avatar, who is sent by the spirits to take away everyone's bending. At first, Amon doesn't believe it and is lying, it's just a power play to make sure no one can oppose him, but over time, he starts to believe his own hype and starts thinking that the spirits actually did choose him to take over the United Republic and remove everyone's bending. He starts using his blood bending more and more, but claims it's just spiritual power. Maybe one of the characters starts to believe Amon, joins his side, and gives up their bending. Eventually, we realize that Amon is doing more harm than good. 
and that his supposed miracle working is just smoke and mirrors. The message here instead would be about how religious dogmatism can cause a ton of harm, and how following somebody because you think they've been divinely ordained to do something is a really bad idea. And that's how I think we can improve them on. There's this common defense of the Legend of Korra that I want to address here, that people will always think of it as bad because it wasn't as good as The Last Airbender. People say that critics are being unfair, comparing the show to a near-universally agreed fantastic piece of media. That's why I didn't do that very much in this video. I don't think that Amon is a bad villain by the standards of Avatar, I think that he's a bad villain in general. I think if you took every antagonist from every piece of pop culture in the past two decades and stacked them up, he would be in the bottom half. Because this is not how you write a villain. It's not how you write a plot about somebody who goes too far, it's not how you write a plot about activism, and it's not how you write a villain who has a point. Amon isn't bad by Avatar standards. He's just bad. And that's where I'm gonna have to wrap up this video. It's super long already, but I don't want to make it any longer. I hope you enjoyed watching, I hope you took my arguments in good faith, and I hope you realize that I still genuinely enjoy a lot of aspects of The Legend of Korra. This wasn't meant to be a hate video on a property you like, it was meant to be a hate video on one specific type of character I really don't like. With all that said, thank you, goodbye, and I'll see you sometime in the future.